Greetings. You're listening to Read My Mind Radio. Chances are you know that already because you press play. Duh. What you may not know is that I'm Thomas Reed, host and producer of this podcast. If this is your first time here, you're actually starting as we're in the midst of what I'm calling season two or flipping the script on audio description. This is where we examine this art form that in its basic essence is making visual content accessible to those of us who are blind or have low vision. But in actuality, it goes way beyond that. Today, we look at the power of one. I know it's the loneliest number and all that, but really, it's only when it chooses to stay by itself. Check this out. Really? My name is Alicia Cunningham, and I'm an author, filmmaker, and photographer, or an artist in general. I'm a Black female, 42 years old. My background is from the Caribbean. My parents from Trinidad. I have Black hair that's a little past my shoulder length, and I am 5'5 five, five and a half, and dark skin. You said author, director, photographer. Which came first? I started doing the Garfield cartoons and any of the comic strips. I would just replicate it. And then photography came afterwards when I went to college. I majored in photography. And then from photography, I became an author. I wrote my first book. It was a photography book. In line with her first book, Feminine Transitions, Alicia continues to challenge perceptions of society's beauty standards. In 2013, she decided to participate in The Big Chop, where she cut off her hair to support cancer awareness. This experience directly led her to her second book of photographs titled, I Am More Than My Hair. It tells the story of women who are bald. Some are completely bald. Some are just patches of hair, different levels in between. What I wanted to do is to make people aware of what alopecia is, which is just hair loss. When encountering a bald woman, chances are most people assume cancer. Yet, according to Alicia, the most common cause is stress. And that can occur earlier than we may expect. The youngest person that I met, she was two at the time that she started losing her hair. My mom told me the story that when she was two, she had to go back to work. She was at home for two years and her daughter started having anxiety or her leaving because she was going to a childcare provider. She said she would just cry hysterically. It was like two weeks of just crying. And from the first day, her hair shedded. So it went from shedding to patches to completely bald. Oh my gosh. Wow. There are also health-related and environmental causes of hair loss. Unfortunately, within the community of Black women in general, we suffer more with hair trauma or losing our hair from like dyes and perms and weaves, extensions, braiding too tight. But then also you have just different levels of stress. As part of both a marketing and fundraising effort, Alicia recorded footage of some of the women included in the book. She applied to Docs in Progress, a nonprofit organization that fosters a creative and supportive community for documentary filmmakers. They have these monthly trailer screenings where you can get feedback on your trailer. But I didn't actually have a trailer. I just had footage. I wanted to get feedback from the audience on the footage. I put like a trailer clip together. A woman in a trailer clip, they accepted my application. They were like, why is this not a film? You need to make this into a documentary. That required her to contact some of the women featured in the book and arranged to capture their stories on camera. The only requirement is I had to have natural lighting. I didn't have lighting at that time. I met them someplace, indoors, outdoors. And that was a learning process as well because I didn't take any classes or anything. So I'm going with the mic on my camera and I'm forgetting that I needed a, a muzzle for my mic and you're hearing the wind sounds. So I had to go do like some reshooting. And I just learned as I went. But I feel like if I would have thought about it beforehand, I don't think I would have done it. One of the women featured in the book and documentary is Marguerite Woods. I refer to myself as a Black woman who is blind, who is bold, who is beautiful. Okay. I am bald. My skin is mocha, leaning towards chocolate and I'm about 5'7". I normally wear sunshades. I love interesting earrings, and so I normally have those on as well. I've got on a dress. It's a black dress, actually. Yeah. Okay. Sleeveless. All right, there we go. <laughs> Margarita's familiar with the art of description. Her first experience began with Bustin' Loose, a film starring Richard Pryor and Cicely Tyson. The description? It was horrible. I thought I would never, ever want to hear another audio-described movie. This was early on in my blindness. 
every aspect of my life was affected. So it kind of took a back seat for me for a while. But the thing that really got me with audio description was I like to go to plays, to conferences and music shows and that kind of thing. In Baltimore, where I lived, they actually had a service where I could call and give them the date and where I was going to go. And they would send someone there. This service would contact the venue and arrange to send someone out to become familiar with the performance. Then, on the day Marguerite was scheduled to attend, this person would meet her there to provide description in her ear using a transmitter and receiver. It was better than asking friends and family what's going on, so I didn't have to disturb them. They would do a great job describing the stage, which I really appreciate, and the background. But where I would have most of my challenges was when they were trying to describe what the action was all about, especially when there was dancing. Everything was so... Without emotion. That's a common critique of early AD narration, especially in artistic expression like dance. It became obvious that the narrator was unfamiliar with the art that they were tasked to describe. Not a great experience for Marguerite, but something many of us can understand. It was better than asking friends and family that attended with me what's going on. We didn't get into that for the purposes of this particular discussion, but that to me sounds like a case of lack of cultural competence. What is more a part of this discussion is her response. So I started talking to them about it, and they actually started listening. They wanted to do something that made more sense, so they started training other staff. They really wanted my feedback, and so I was able to do that. Understanding that it's an evolving art, and also recognizing that I'm not the only person that they're describing to. Marguerite recognizes and appreciates the improvements she's experienced over the years, including how the narration sounds more like it's just part of the film itself. When Alicia was looking for women who were bought to participate in her book, she put the word out and heard back from a friend who told her about Marguerite. She called me one day and we talked. I just felt good about her energy and what she was trying to do. So I said yes to meeting her because I was the only blind person that she dealt with. I would share with her what it was like for me. I invited her to a couple of chapter meetings. Those are meetings of the National Federation of the Blind. Marguerite wanted Alicia to understand that while she herself is blind, she doesn't represent everyone. I go to a lot of events where I'm the only blind person there. Sort of like when you go and you're the only black person. Mm -hmm. People tend to relate to every other person that they think is similar from what they know about you. I'm always encouraging people to go to places where there are lots of other people that may look like me. We're multifaceted. We're not all the same, just like sighted people are not all the same. We're diverse in, in so many things, so don't just think you really understand what's going on with blind people because you met me. Alicia got it. She heard what we were saying about being able to relate to our society and our world, just like sighted people. We just want to have the ability to access information and entertainment and education and art. All manner of things. And we just need the tools that allow us to do it. And everybody's using tools. And our tools are just a little bit different than some other folks. She was inspired. She really felt like she wanted to be a part of that, opening it up for all people. She's a woman of her word. Every moment that I've known her, every time she was inspired, she just set out to get it done. About two months following that meeting, Alicia premiered her documentary in the theater. Marguerite was there. She realized the impact of the visuals based on the audience response. But she didn't know because there was no AD. So even though I heard it then, I didn't really put the two cents together until she came to the my screening. It was about two months after that conversation. And I put it out in the Docs in Progress, which is a group for documentary filmmakers. If anyone can refer me to any audio describers and anyone who's a captioner, please let me know. And one of the women in the group, she's actually blind as well. And she's a documentarian. Now check out the Read My Mind Radio family connection, y'all. That documentarian was none other than 2019 Read My Mind Radio alumni, Dayal Muhammad. She told me about Cheryl. That's my good friend. And another 2019 Read My Mind Radio alumni, Cheryl Green. Captioner and audio description writer and narrator extraordinaire. I love her process because she's like, you need to be the one to describe how you think it's best to describe. It's like a back and forth with her and not just like, all right, let me just do it and then be done. I was involved in the process of that AD as well. It goes beyond audio description and captions in the documentary. Alicia created an accessible exhibit on display at Sandy Spring Museum in Maryland. 
The exhibit includes photographs accompanied by a lithophane replica of the portrait. That's a three-dimensional image that can be explored by touch and creates a unique visual experience when a light is placed underneath. Written descriptions are included in Braille. She also did the audio description for all the pictures that are in the exhibit. It's written out on the wall, you got a QR code, when you scan the QR code, then you can hear the voice description. How did you come up with that? I was doing research for about a year, trying to figure out how to make an accessible exhibit. There's a John Brown Museum in Harpers Ferry. You click the button by each exhibit. I like how they actually described what I was looking at. I contacted the museum and National Park Services and they gave me the number and the lady who I spoke to connected me with Julie Hine. She has a device called the Discovery Pen. So you can either scan the QR code with your phone, you can read it on the wall, I have braille description as well, and then the Discovery Pens can be scanned on the sheet with each name of each participant on the wall, each photograph. What stands out to me about this is how much individual research was necessary to develop this exhibit. I guess I assumed the museum would be more familiar with the process and even have the technology on hand to make it happen. This was their first experience, so they weren't able to guide me at all. I was pretty much on my own with this to be honest. And they never did anything as far as accessibility is concerned either. So like no ASL interpreters, no audio description. This was their first experience in general. I think it has opened up their eyes to what's the possibilities, but I don't think they're there as yet as saying like, this is what we have to do going forward. My hope for this was having the exhibit and also having a, a panel discussion with Cheryl was also involved and Marguerite, Julie and three other women was that this will be an example of how museums and artists can incorporate accessibility in their work and into their venues. One of the main challenges from the perspective of the museums and venues is often funding. But I've done some outreach to different organizations in the area that do provide funding, like Maryland State Arts Council, as well as the Arts and Manatees Council of Montgomery County and NEA. They would provide funding for that. So it's just a matter of just saying it's vital enough that I need to make sure that it's mandatory in the museum. Hopefully they take it more seriously and get there, but they're not there yet. Unfortunately, we know that sometimes museums and other venues and businesses want to see a return on investment. But it's not as simple as build it and they will come. This can't be a one-time thing. It's like now that you know, how could you not do anything about it? Because now you're aware of it because it's in your space. The museums or galleries, they love the idea. But it just seems like they don't really want to put the work out there to do it or to get the funding for it artists at the same time they like the idea as well and they appreciate it it seems to be the same thing and i get as an artist it's a lot to try to get funding like it's trying to do proposals it's sometimes you're just going to be just the artist and you want to go through all of that but i just feel like it has to be mandatory i did go to the extent of getting of making 3d prints i did lithophanes so that you can feel it but the thing is it doesn't even have to go that far did you get any feedback from non-disabled people yes so I have two different reactions. I did a screening online and I played the one with AD and the captioning. It was two responses. One, it was like, oh, wow. The audio description helped me to realize what was happening. I saw some things that I would not have seen without the AD, which is also my experience when I first heard audio description. And then I had this other side of it where people were like, I'm hearing this voice and I don't want to hear it. Like, how do I take that off? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, it makes me laugh so. because right. when you <laughs> when you do a Google search for audio description, one of the top things that comes up is how do I turn audio description off? Oh, really? Yeah, it's sort of disheartening when you try to advocate for it. Is I'm sorry, y'all, but sometimes I really do just have to laugh. Spending time and energy advocating for something can be challenging. For Marguerite. Advocating isn't about a specific outcome. It's not that I didn't want everything to be accessible. That's not it at all. It's about relationships. People should desire to do what they do. I don't care who it's for, but you need to desire to do it and, and not just do it because somebody's telling you you should. I was more interested in her getting a sense of blind people and that we are asking for opportunities to be able to relate to our world just like sighted people are. And that she is an artist and a creative person would do whatever she would do with it. And that would be good enough. And that sounds like it was effective. I think it's because she's an artist, first of all. And I think because she and I connected on a deep, soulful and spiritual level. She wants to share her understanding with the larger society. So I mean something to her just like she means something to me. It wasn't just because of me. I sort of 
help to spark it, if you will. You know this goes beyond audio description, right? Just interacting on different levels, asking people to recognize because I'm here in this space and I want to participate. There are things that can happen that will allow me to be able to do that independently as a whole person, not as a broken person that you get to feel sorry for. That's not what I'm asking. And sometimes because people don't know, you got to be in their mix to get your conversation in there. It's more for opening it up so that diverse abilities can take a part in what's going on creatively as well as enjoying it inspiring it, encouraging it, every aspect that's possible. Sometimes you can demonstrate that better and you can do it easier with people that you're connecting with. Marguerite herself is an artist. She's quite thoughtful and makes some deep connections between the More Than My Hair project and, well, life, for example. Aesthetically, hair means a lot to a lot of people in in so many different ways. I've come to understand that as an individual, you get to choose what you like and what you don't like. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to like what I like, but respect that I'm here and that I'm doing what I like. And we can all exist with that in mind. How about blindness and disability? People tend to want to treat you like you're less than because you don't have the same access to vision that other people have. But I think every individual is going through something, whether it's something that other people can see or not, something that they are trying to embrace or understand and live their lives, not in spite of, but maybe because of, because I'm blind, because I'm bald, I tend to relate to myself and other people in a particular way. It just makes, I think, the playing field more interesting and it expands it more. And um, I think it allows for great creativity. As an African-American? Most of us realize that we've grown up in a country that has not been kind or fair to any of us. Even if we don't have the words to speak about it, it's a heavy burden to exist and grow in this society when the majority of the power structure is literally walking around with disdain for us because of the color of our skin. You can put on a happy face and move around, and and that's fine. But I think that it's deeper than a happy face. I think that there's some natural laws of the universe that are at work all the time, and it would be beneficial to get in touch with what they are and try to work your life from there. Because if you go with the laws that this country is offering, it's given a message that's not healthy. And it's not about well-being, especially for my community and for me. Finding that comfort in your own skin can take a lot of work, especially when listening to voices other than your own. I was holding some beliefs about blindness and baldness that I didn't even realize because we pick up things incrementally as we're growing. So you don't really know what those things culminate into in terms of your beliefs and your belief systems. If it's painful, it's not serving you and you're ready to let it go. And you thought it was just about hair. You thought... Audio description was just about entertainment. Alicia's working on another documentary that explores how women who have experienced vision loss see beauty without sight. As we know, beauty is often only thought about from the visual perspective. Totally unrelated to that project, she's also working on a new project in the horror genre and says she's making sure to build space for audio description. She's continuing to give panel discussions on how to make art accessible based on her experience. And how artists and museums can incorporate that into their work as well. Even something as simple as wheelchair height. So the pieces of your art that should be seen or touched should be a certain height so that someone in a wheelchair can have access to it as well. I feel like it has to be incorporated. And if you're not, then you're discriminating. I feel like also the funders who are funding these venues and even artists should make that a major part of their proposals as well. And if it's not being incorporated, then I don't think you should get the funding. Whether you're a consumer who can help someone learn about access, a creator who can make your content inclusive, or you're someone who can provide the funding, we all play a part. It's more than just one. The I Am More Than My Hair Accessible Exhibit will be on display through September 5th, 2021. Unfortunately, COVID restrictions have probably been a factor in the lack of feedback from the disabled community. But Alicia's hopeful that the restrictions being lifted will help bring out more people. She's currently seeking distribution for I Am More Than My Hair, the documentary. 
which at some point will stream online. The book can be purchased on my website, alicia.com. My first name, A-L-Y-S-C-I-A.com. I have a newsletter list on their option where you can sign up so that when the film comes out, I can send out that information that it will be available. And all my social media pages are on there as well. And Marguerite? They can hit me up on Messenger. They can email me as well. M. Woods with an S. 719 at gmail.com. I can tell you right now, based on our conversation, I hope to reach back out to Marguerite. You just kind of slipped in that I ended up in India. Like, you don't just end up in India from Baltimore, <laughs> okay? So, like, like I know there's a story there. You didn't make a wrong turn. <laughs> a very big shout-out to Alicia Cunningham and Marguerite Woods. You both are now... An official part of the Read My Mind Radio family. Much respect to your advocacy, your art, and your access. This is just one example of what we know to be true. When creators learn that their content is not accessible to an audience, chances are pretty high that they will want to do something about that. Well, at least the cool ones. Oh, yeah. If you yourself are one of the cool ones, you're probably already subscribed or following this podcast on your favorite platform. If not, what the hell are you waiting for? <sighs> Remember, you can always find transcripts and links and more on readmymind.com. And for some strange reason, people seem to get this confused. Let me clarify. It's R to the E. I. D. D. And that's me in a place to be. Like my last name.